Welcome to a special bonus episode of the Jesus Calling Podcast, featuring multiple guests who have appeared in their own episodes of the Jesus Calling Podcast, speaking to the power of prayer. We hope you find inspiration from their stories of how a simple act of prayer brings hope, peace, and a deeper relationship with God to people from all walks of life. We'll start with a thought from the wife of country music star, Thomas Rhett, author Lauren Akins. I can see looking back where the Lord has shut doors and opened doors. And I try to have the motto of where He opens a door, I'll walk through it, regardless of what I can see on the other side. There were a few times where I can vividly remember just crying and feeling so weak in my faith and doubtful. And just like, I didn't know how much longer I could keep going. And I was just honest with God about those feelings that, you know, I was angry at times. I was doubtful at times. And I did stay close to the Lord. That didn't mean that I always had a good attitude about things. I'll be quite honest. But what I did have was a faith-based community surrounding me and praying for me and checking in on me on a daily basis. and. They were constantly encouraging me, having honest conversations with me, praying for me. And through it all, I know why God wants us to have community because there were times where I felt like I just couldn't pray another prayer. Or when I felt the weakest in those moments, truly that is where I could just feel Jesus was just carrying me on the backs of my friends spiritually. And on his back, obviously. And it's amazing to me how Jesus is just in every detail. And and my faith now is completely different, as well as my husband's. Our faith is completely different. And I know that was him molding and shaping us and teaching us even more about him and his faithfulness and how his plan truly is greater. And I've learned to let him take control of a lot of things. Not that he wasn't already taking control, but I think sometimes we have this mentality where we feel like we can control things for ourselves and we can take care of ourselves and it's just not the case. We can all love that one in front of us wherever that one is, whether it's in a classroom and you've got a class full of kids or you're a mom and you've got a house full of kids, or if you do missions and you're traveling all over the world, or it's somebody at the grocery store, whatever that is, you know, the Lord puts people in front of us to love well. That is our number one job here is to love well. Our creator, he created us and he also created our love. And the closer you get to him, the closer you get to love and you can't get too close. There's no such thing. So the more and more we can get to know him and live in sync with him each day and, you know, inviting the spirit to be in every facet of your being and in every relationship and every conversation. To me, that's the most important thing about my days. And as a wife, as a mom, as a friend, as just a woman living in Nashville, Tennessee, the most important thing is inviting him into your world so that you're able to see the world through his eyes and you're able to love the way that he loves and how he's modeled and tried to teach us to love. And the way you get close to him is spending that time with him. And I've learned over time that I have to get into a quiet place And for me, it's got to be in the mornings before my day gets going. Some days it feels so dark in the world and it's easy to get discouraged and be ready for him to come on back so we can all just go home. But he's not done, clearly, and he's got more to teach and he's got more people for us to love and to take his love to them. So that's such an encouraging passage that makes me feel so at peace and also makes me excited for eternity and how everything is going to be right one day. And it makes me really, really excited for that. 
Joyce and John Smith, whose real life story about the miraculous power of prayer was depicted in the movie Breakthrough, starring Chrissy Metz. I was expecting that telephone call that morning because I was going to go pick John up. We were meeting one of the boys' mom, halfway Cindy Rieger, and we were going to exchange kids. And so when I got the telephone call, I was expecting it, but not what she was going to be saying to me. And just before I'd gotten the telephone call, I had read a devotion on my cell phone that a friend of mine had written on Facebook, and it was talking about what we do in times of crisis. What's our first go-to? Is it God? Do we trust Him? Do we trust Him with the things that goes on in our lives? And it was God preparing me. And so when I got the telephone call, I was upset. I mean, anybody would be when they tell you that you, you know, they've just pulled your son out of the lake and he doesn't have a heartbeat. Yes, I was upset. But my first go-to was God to pray. I mean, that was what I had been prepared to do over the weeks beforehand. And so all the way to the hospital, I'm praying. We adopted John from Guatemala when he was five and a half months old, and we had prayed for him for 17 years. He was our gift from God. And so I just I just started interceding. God, you this is your gift. You gave him to us, Lord. And and you say, you know, that we can come to you with the things that's going on in our lives and you're there to be faithful to us and answer our prayers. And so I just started interceding for John and for his life and asking God for his life. I was upset and I was crying, but I knew God was going to take care of it. I just didn't know how he was going to do it. And sure, never dreaming that it was going to be this miraculous. They finally let me back to where John was. They had held off calling time of death until I got there, which is unusual because usually they want to do that before the family gets there. But again, God in there putting his spin on this at any time, you know, he could have jump started John's heart. But this is what I really feel about that. He had set about 25 to 30 professionals in that room to show them something so powerful that none of them would ever forget. And so when I got there, they let me sit for a couple of minutes. And then finally, Dr. Sutter walked over to me and said, you can go up and um, talk to John, which I thought was kind of strange because in my mind, John was not going to die. I mean, that was my mindset. So I got up to the end of the bed and I felt his feet and they were cold and they were gray. And there was, you know, it was flat line on the heart monitor. And in my head, I heard this what I'd heard all my life. It says, the Holy Spirit who raised Christ Jesus from the dead. And so I just said, Holy Spirit, please come and bring me back my son. And I've been told, I didn't think I was speaking that loud, but I was told that everyone in the emergency room area could hear me pray. But immediately, as soon as I said that prayer, John's heart started beating. And to me at that point in time, the work was done. The rest just had to catch up with it. I knew God had answered my prayer and was going to be faithful to the things I'd ask him for. When she prayed, something so powerful rushed up my body that it pushed three nurses searching for a pulse physically back, and they can't explain it. In fact, Alex Gidden, who was the nurse that had told us about, you know, when I prayed something so powerful moved up his body that, you know, it was pushing them back. She said, for 27 minutes, I had had my finger on his pulse and I was getting nothing. And she said, and then when it started, it, I was so stunned and you could hear it in her voice. She goes, I have a pulse. I have a pulse. I have a pulse. She could not believe that, you know, after all that they had done, finally, when we prayed, God gave him back a pulse. And so, you know, it just to have this happen is mind boggling. So they get me alive, but I am not out of the woods. Shortly after, I am flown to Cardinal Glennon in the city of St. Louis. Even after we got him over to Cardinal Glennon, the doctor, Dr. Garrett, who came in and after examining John, he sat down and he was very straight with us he told us he said john only has rudimentary brain function really he is brain dead he said we're giving him stuff to keep his heart beating we've got him on a lung machine he can't breathe on his own he said how far do you want us to go because he's not going to live through the night and even if he lives through the night after being deprived of oxygen for over an hour he's going to have brain damage 
And so to hear those things, and it it really hit me hard, and I thought to myself, you don't know what you're talking about because my God has healed my son. I have that assurance, and that's what's going on my head. So I stood up, and I kind of got over close by him, and I said, here's the deal. I said, we're not going to have any kind of this talk here, like you just said. That will not go on in his room. And I said, I've heard that you're the best. You do your job. And then God will take care of the rest of it. And I walked out of the room. It wasn't until after John got out of the hospital and a month or so later, when we had our first responder Sunday, that I even heard all the things that was going wrong in John's body and why he shouldn't be alive. He was in catastrophic organ failure. Again, they were having to give him medication to keep his heart going. And all these things, he should not be alive. And it's just amazing to sit back and look at that. And when you're in those circumstances and they're telling you that this is not as possible, yet God's saying, I'm the final word on this and it is possible. John woke up on the third day recognizing people. He couldn't talk because he was intubated, yet he could answer with thumbs up, thumbs down, shaking his head yes or no, the doctors couldn't believe that he had that kind of thought. You know, they they gave him a really difficult test. It was funny because John wouldn't react to the doctor when he first came in. He was reacting to us, but he wouldn't. So finally, uh, our pastor said to him, he says, ask him about basketball. And so he asked him about Michael Jordan and LeBron James and all the questions, you know, who had the most rings, who had this, you know, who, and John was answering all those questions appropriately. And when he got finished, he looked at John and he said, do you know what a miracle is? And John shook his head, yes. And he said, son, you're a miracle. Author and Jesuit priest, Father James Martin. People think prayer is kind of an aptitude. It's like, you know, I can sing, right? I have a good voice. And if you don't have a good voice and you don't have, you know, sort of uh, an ear for music, that's it, right? So people think, well, I tried it and I guess I can't do it, right? Or like skating or dancing or something like that or painting. And that's it. And they give up, which is sad because prayer is for everybody. And, you know, because God is for everybody. Everyone I've ever met (laughs) goes through dry patches. And look, sometimes I sit down in my chair every morning and not a whole lot feels like it's happening. Something's happening on a deep level. I think we have to trust that. But that's okay. That doesn't mean I've done something wrong or that God is mad at me. That's not the way God works. It's just, you know, it's just kind of the ups and downs of the spiritual life. And so that can make people feel suspicious of prayer as well, that I've done something wrong and God's not going to be with me. And so all these things need to be challenged. So many people have an image of God that they have from their childhood that can be really burdensome and really unhelpful and actually not God. So one of my friends memorably described God as, which I love, the parole officer. First of all, we're evil. We've just gotten out of jail and God's looking for something that we've done to kind of condemn us and to send us right back to jail. Well, again, obviously God wants us to lead good lives and, you know, act lovingly and do the right thing. But that's not the God that you find in Jesus Christ. You know, this is this God of compassion and mercy and forgiveness. And often it is, what I what I try to do is I try to say, now look, there's the God that you have in your mind that may be a burden to you. And then you're, there's your actual experience of God. Trust that experience. And then that can be really helpful for people to get rid of some of the unhelpful ideas and constructs of who God is. When someone has an experience of God, either in their daily life or in their prayer, right, that's, you know, really unmistakable, right? They feel God's presence. They feel that God has reached out to them in a particular way. And by that, I mean something that happens in prayer, emotion, insight, desire, memory, feeling, right? Something, connection, as well as in their daily life, right? Which could be just, you know, a kind word or just an insight or a feeling of God's presence. And when you can invite that person to see that this is God communicating with them and that that it is a sign of God's love for them, it can be overwhelming. You know, it's like, who, me? God loves us. And so once people are able to accept that love, it really is transformational. They know that they're valued and who they are and that they are enough. I'd really encourage people who feel that they've never had a satisfying prayer experience, that they can't pray, that only their prayer is dry that they're not praying the way they quote unquote should pray, or that somehow their prayer is unsatisfying to keep at it. 
the idea is to trust that God is waiting to hear from you and that also that there's no wrong way or right way to pray. Anything that helps you to feel closer to God is something that you should try to do. So just be open to that and to allow yourself to let God reveal himself to you in the way that God wants to reveal himself to you, not to someone else, and to just keep trying. Because really prayer is available and is open to everyone. If I can pray, you can pray. <laughs> Worship leader turned author and speaker, Carlos Whitaker. As I was continuing to grow in my career as a worship leader and as a worship artist with Integrity Music, I always knew deep down inside that I really loved to communicate and to talk in between the songs. Like I enjoyed singing, but it was really what I said between the songs. And more and more people began to tell me, Carlos, have you ever thought about speaking and not singing? And I'm like, oh, I mean, I'm really good at speaking for 30 seconds between a song, but I definitely would never do that. But more and more people begin to say, I just feel like you're more of a thought leader than a worship leader. And I'll tell you what, like this was 2011, 2012. I was at the time leading worship at Elevation Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, at North Point Community Church in Atlanta, at Cross Point Church here in Nashville, Tennessee. Like I was on the up and up leading worship on some of the biggest stages. And the thought of me giving that up to do something that many people around me that were close to me told me that maybe I was better at doing was a really scary, scary thing to think about doing. So I prayed about it one day and I felt very clearly the Lord telling me they're right. You are supposed to be a speaker and an author next. That is the next thing I have for you. Well, let me tell you, friends, I heard that from God and said, thank you, God, but no thank you. And for the next six months, just continued to ignore the call of Jesus and Holy Spirit in my life to move from this one season of faith in my journey to the next season. And so I ignored it, ignored it until finally my wife, of course, it's always, it always comes to my wife. She hears from the Lord so clearly. She said, hey, babe, I, I know you've been running from the voice of God. And I just want to tell you as your wife that I know it's scary because all of our income is on worship leading, but I trust God enough to allow you to chase after his voice. So in that moment, I went to my laptop and I opened up my Gmail and I went to my booking email account and I had 87 worship leading dates set for the rest of the year. That was my income. I was at, at conferences and at churches. And in one single email, I emailed all 87 of these events and I said, hey, the Lord is calling me to be a speaker and an author. So I'm going to step out in faith and become that. So I'm going to cancel me leading worship for you. So if you'd like your deposits back, I'd be happy to send those back. But if you'd like me to um, come speak at your event, I would love to come speak at your event. Just reply back and, I, and we can set that up. Now, I did that in full faith full confidence that I was going to get 87 emails the next morning going, of course, Carlos, come to our event and be our speaker. Um, but of course, as the story unfolds over the next few days, I kept getting email after email from all of these events and churches going, congratulations, that's awesome that you're following the, the call of Jesus in your life. But go ahead and send our deposits back because we already have a speaker. But congratulations on chasing after the voice of God. Well, one day turned into three, which turned into seven which turned into 10, which turned into 13. And I'll never forget 13 days into this wilderness of losing all of my income, watching our bank account get sucked dry from all the deposits leaving and nobody booking me to speak at their event. I began to question the voice of God. I began to question, did I really hear God correctly? God, there, there's no way that I heard you correctly if I'm losing all this money. So I almost went back to my inbox and emailed all 87 events going, I made a mistake. I heard the voice of God wrong. But instead I said, you know what, Lord, I'm going to continue to obey. So I went to Home Depot and I filled out an application. I went to Starbucks and I filled out an application and I was embarrassed to do that because I'd been on the road with all these big bands. I'd been, my platform was growing and suddenly I'm going to be working at an hourly job. But the Lord said just to continue to be obedient, put one foot in front of the other. That was day 13. Day 14, I opened up my inbox to my booking email and I saw an email in there and it, it was from whitehouse.gov. And so before I even 
opened it. I just delete it because why in the world would the White House be emailing me? This must be spam. Well, about 30 minutes after I, I deleted that email, I got a call from my publicist and she said, they know you deleted the email. You've got to go open your deleted folder. So I go to my deleted folder. I open it up. And there's that one email and it said the subject line was the white house would like to invite you to speak at the president's easter prayer breakfast next tuesday in the east room of the white house friends 14 days after i started my journey in the wilderness i got an email for my very first booking and it was to speak in front of the most powerful human being on planet earth. My first speaking gig was going to be at the White House. So fast forward seven days and I find myself having breakfast at the same table with the president of the United States of America, giving a 10 minute devotional thought to 50 of the most powerful, influential people in our country, and then singing a song. So they actually asked me to sing a song and I sang, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I'll never forget walking out of that house knowing that it doesn't matter how long you're in the wilderness if the lord has promised you something he will come through with it and that was the most nervous i've ever been to give a talk it's been downhill from there um and i just i'll, I'll, I'll never forget the moment and i i got to declare the goodness of god in the White House. I got to hear voices echoing down the halls and the chambers of the White House. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I just hope that this story encourages you guys. When the Lord tells you to do something scary, I promise you the risk is worth it. Country music artist, Travis Tritt. I am a big believer in counting your blessings. So my prayers start off each night with thanking God for all the blessings. And like the old song says, you know, count your blessings, name them one by one. I do that every single night when I pray. I thank God, first of all, for my health. I thank him for my family. I thank him for my family's health. I thank him for the protection that he has provided for me over the years keeping us out of harm's way. I thank him for salvation. I thank him for the talent that he blessed me with. I don't know why on earth he chose me, but I'm so thankful for it. And not only the talent that he blessed me with, but also the ability to be able to use that talent to go out and entertain people, to make people smile and forget their troubles for a little while or lift people up or take them on a, a journey in their mind or their spirit and be able to not only do that, but to be able to use that to make an extremely good living for me and my family members. All of those are blessings and they came from one place and that's God. I know those things happened from heaven without a shadow of a doubt. So I thank God for those things every single night. I just recently became familiar with Jesus Calling, but once I found out about it, I started listening to the podcast as part of a like a morning ritual, morning routine. And there's always something there. There's always something, you know, inspirational for me that I can read and take as part of my faith. And it applies to, it almost seems like that each day, the things that you hear on the Jesus Calling podcasts in some way or another are things that apply to whatever it is I'm dealing with that particular day or at that particular time. So it's very inspirational to me. I've seen the power of prayer in a bunch of places in my life. I mean, obviously, I've seen, first of all, if it wasn't for the power of prayer, I probably wouldn't be here. Because in my younger days, when I was in my early 20s, I was a hell raiser. And I was off doing a bunch of things that I shouldn't have done, partying way too much, drinking way too much, drinking and driving, doing stupid things, stupid things. 
And there were several incidents that I was involved in where I could have killed myself, could have killed other people, could have been involved in terrible, terrible accidents, other situations that were extremely dangerous. Just situations that I don't think I would have been able to endure or live through had it not been for my mother, who I knew every single time that I was out, wherever it was, I knew that my mother was at home praying for me. And I knew my grandfather and my grandmother, her mom and dad, were praying for me. And they were devout. I mean, they were devout. I used to say all the time, these people are tight with God, tight. And I knew for whatever reason that they would call me and tell me from time to time that, you know, I don't know what's going on with you right now or, or what what's happening with you, but for some reason or another, last night, I just felt this real strong compulsion to pray for you. And as it happened, in just about every one of those cases, I was in a very, very dangerous situation right at that very moment. That's God. I remember hearing my pastor years ago as a very young, young person. He said, when Jesus says, lay your burdens down, he doesn't mean for you to bring the burdens to him and then lay them down and then pick them back up again when you walk away. It's lay them down permanently and leave them with him. That's what faith is. And that does give you a tremendous amount of peace to be able to take those burdens to God in prayer and be able to leave them there and not worry. And it gives you so much freedom. At least it has for me. And I know it has for a bunch of other people as well. Author of Jesus Calling, Sarah Young. We live in stressful times and many of us struggle with anxiety. The Apostle Paul's teaching in his letter to the Philippians is very practical and timely. He wrote in Philippians 4, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I admit that praying doesn't come naturally to us. In fact, it's frequently viewed as a tedious chore. Prayer certainly does require effort, but we need to remember that communicating with the creator and sustainer of this vast universe is an amazing privilege. Jesus sacrificial death for our sins opened the way for us to commune freely and fully with our Father God. The moment Jesus died, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew 27, 51. So our unrestricted access to God in prayer is a glorious blood-bought privilege. While Jesus lived on this earth, he listened wonderfully well to the people around him. I'm grateful that he continues to listen to us. We have the miraculous help of the Holy Spirit. As we're praying, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And God, who searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with God's will. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Our prayers may be inadequate and fragmented, but the Holy Spirit transforms them and makes them consistent with God's will. One of my favorite verses about prayer is Psalm 62, 8. In this psalm, King David urges us to trust in God at all times 
and pour out our hearts to him. Jesus knows everything in our hearts and he longs for us to trust him enough to open up and be real with him in our prayers. Since he understands us completely and loves us eternally, we can safely unburden ourselves to him. Instead of focusing on our problems when we're feeling anxious, we can bring everything to Jesus, our struggles and confusion, our prayers and petitions, our thanksgiving and praise. After pouring out our hearts to him, we can ask him to fill us with his wondrous peace. To receive this glorious gift, we need to relax in Jesus' presence and trust him wholeheartedly instead of relying on our own understanding. I'm thankful that God uses our prayers not only to change circumstances, but to change us. We bring our prayer requests to him, trusting that he hears and he cares. As we devote time to communicating with Jesus and enjoying his presence, we gradually grow to be more like him. I realize that unanswered prayers can be discouraging. While we're waiting for answers, we need to trust that God hears our prayers and responds to them in ways that make perfect sense from his infinite, all-knowing perspective. Although we would love to understand more, it's often impossible for us finite creatures to fathom God's ways. The Bible encourages us to persevere in our prayers. I love the parable in Luke 18 about the unjust judge versus the persistent widow. This parable teaches us that we should keep praying and not give up. Even though the judge didn't care about people or justice, the persistence of the widow eventually wore him down and he granted her request. How much more will God, who is loving and just, answer our prayers in his perfect way and timing? Bishop T.D. Jakes. When I say pray like your grandmother and dream like your daughter, I'm saying that you don't have to forsake one for the other. You can still have ambition and tenacity and drive and still be grounded like your grandmother was. And it, it might be a reflection of my own experiences and both of my grandmothers were praying women. And our community tends to be matriarchal when I think of my my Baptist grandmother, my first remembrance of her is sitting in a rocking chair with a Bible in her lap, a big Bible, big family Bible should have been on a mantle somewhere. <laughs> and my paternal grandmother, I mean, she went to church, she took care of sick people. We had to go visit everybody and bring food to everybody and have the reverend over for dinner. And <laughs> she knew all the hymns and all the scriptures. And uh, those women, uh, I can't even begin to express what an impact they had on my life. So, you know, I'm being surrounded by them and my sister and later in life, my wife and now my daughters. I've seen a wide peripheral view of femininity at different stages and ages and have a great deal of respect for the tenacity and the endurance of, of women. And in almost every case, uh, somewhere in the backdrop behind the curtain was prayer. Every woman has to use prayer both as offense and defense. The sword as offense, the shield as defense, because you've got blows coming at you from every direction, and prayer is a shield, but you've also got it as a weapon as well, and you need both of them. You can't just play defense and not play offense. Jesus talks about that bringing forth much fruit he is actually talking about prayer whatsoever you desire when you pray he's talking about the fruitfulness of a prayerful reflection with god 
that God is glorified by answering our prayers. I would like to encourage every listener that God's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear and his arm is not short that he cannot save. And I'm not suggesting that every time you pray that God will do as you direct. But in the process of praying, you will hear what he has purposed. And sometimes prayer changes things and other times prayer changes you. To close out this bonus episode, Bishop Jakes blesses us with a reading from Jesus Calling about prayer. I am a God of both intricate detail and overflowing abundance. When you entrust the details of your life to me, you are surprised by how thoroughly I answer your petitions. I take pleasure in hearing your prayers, so feel free to bring me all your requests. The more you pray, the more answers you can receive. Best of all, your faith is strengthened as you see how precisely I respond to your specific prayers, because I am infinite in all my ways. You need not fear that I will run out of resources. Abundance is at the very heart of who I am. Come to me in joyful expectation of receiving all you need and sometimes much more. I delight in showering blessings on my beloved children. Come to me with open hands and heart ready to receive all I have for you. Thank you for listening to the special bonus episode of the Jesus Calling podcast about prayer. Also, be sure to check out the new prayer devotional from Sarah Young, Jesus Listens, now available everywhere. If you like what you heard during this episode, be sure and subscribe to the Jesus Calling podcast wherever you get your podcasts so you can hear the full stories from each of these guests and many more. Plus, you'll be alerted about each of these monthly bonus episodes. For more information on Jesus Calling and Sarah Young, please visit JesusCalling.com or join the conversation on our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and TikTok.